Hey guys, Mark Weppett here with another episode of the Man to Man podcast series. And today we have an extremely interesting guest who is known online as Brute DeForce. I found Brute's content on Twitter and I immediately fell in love with it. On first glance, the more civilized among you might want to dismiss Brute as some sort of meathead tough guy bro, but that would be a mistake. Brute is a deep thinker and a philosopher who has forged his insights in the fire of being a high stakes professional gambler. If you're looking for a kick in the pants or you're looking just for some motivational rocket fuel, then I think you will love this conversation. I know I absolutely did. If you enjoy what you hear, then make sure you give Brute a follow on Twitter, at Brute DeForce. Also, if you want to hear more about the concepts that I mentioned around brain training, then check out my web class in the description below called Manhood Mastery, The Three Secrets to Neuromasculine Training. In it, I'll teach you how to work with your male biology so that you can unleash your potential and become the man that you're meant to be. But that's enough of this. Hope you enjoy the convo. Boom. All right. Today I am joined by the guy who currently runs my favorite Twitter account. He's what I would consider the Socrates of testosterone. He's known online as Brute DeForce. Brute, thank you for being here today. Appreciate it, man. Glad to be here. <laughs> so should I call you Brute? Like, do you keep your real name offline or what? Yeah, you can call me Brute. Okay. Cool. So, I mean, you definitely don't keep your opinions offline. You actually had me cracking up uh, earlier from your voice post from F uh, from yesterday. Like the first five words are, is, "Science is so fucking gay." <laughs> it was it was killing me. And uh, you go on to make then a very interesting point about it, which I found myself mostly agreeing with. And uh, we'll get to all that here shortly. But I'm curious, how much of your stuff out there is like, is it intentionally funny? Or is it just the fact that I'm seeing like, a kind of talk, a kind of persona that's usually kind of relegated to the locker rooms and things like that out in the public sphere. And that's funny to me. Or are you, you sometimes post stuff and just kind of chuckle to yourself? I kind of chuckle to myself, man. It's all kind of just fun and games for me. And I think that, uh, you know, when you're coming from that, from that uh, brutally honest place, it comes out, it, it kind of associates itself with that kind of British wry humor. Yeah. It, it's kind of very <laughs> dry, but yeah, it definitely slaps in a certain way. I think, especially when you're fucking reaching deep to, you know, dispense those kind of truths. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I see, uh, a group of guys online really resonating with your content because it's clear that this stuff that you're writing, um, it comes from a unique perspective. It's not just front. Like there's a, like, first of all, you know, congrats for putting your face on your stuff. Like, you know, I, I'm, I don't hate anonymous Twitter accounts, but there's a lot of like tough guys on Twitter who have like, a uh, you know fake profile picture and stuff like that acting real hard and things and it's just it's hard for me to like really calibrate the person that it's coming from you know it might be just this pencil necked guy living in his mom's basement for all I know but with you at least you're you know you're willing to put rather controversial opinions out there in a controversial way and uh, that in and of itself is refreshing and the fact that you then have some interesting thoughts to back it up uh, makes it all the more compelling. So what's it been like for you to to sort of rise? Like how long you been on Twitter and posting and all that kind of stuff? Because I know you've been around for a little while, but it seems like you're blowing up a little bit here. Yeah. So in, I mean, my account's from 2010, but I was more of a, just a lurker. Yeah. Uh, more of a spectator account. I was just kind of consuming content. And then right when COVID hit, um, it kind of drove me out of this nice routine that I had. And so I just decided to just start firing at the hip. Um, and I have literally zero clue how my account blew up. I didn't have any friends. I didn't do any of that circle jerking, uh, <laughs> DM retweet for retweet exchange. Yeah. I just started firing, um, from the hip, like I said, and, um, here we are. I mean, it's, it was just all organic and I just kind of surfed the tsunami and, That's uh, right. yeah. I'm still surfing it, man. <laughs> well, that's that's the way to do it. I mean, you know, I, you got to play the game if you got to play the game, which is where I find myself in. Uh, but if I could just kind of tap that vein, uh, that's weird. The thing about the algorithms, they're weird. It's like sometimes you just hit something that pops. Like I remember like on TikTok, I went from like we were going to just put our shit on there. I don't even actually use it. My team posts on there. And like one of our clips, it was just like me. Uh, like making fun of like how absurd a guy looks when he jerks off. 
it got like 1.4 million views and I went from zero to like 50,000 followers. And it's just like, sometimes things just, they just go off and you don't know. Um, and you just got to ride it. <laughs> yeah. You just got to ride it. Yeah. So speaking of where your stuff comes from, what, what is it that you do? Like, cause I, I've heard you mention it a few times, like that you're a high stakes professional gambler. Is that right? Yeah. I've been doing it for 10 years. Um, that's my primary source. Actually, it's my only source of income. Hmm. Um, I have a system. I've developed a team over a long excruciating process to kind of get to where I'm at. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm risk on in any market climate, I'm full bore risk on at all times. Interesting. So what kind of like betting is it? Like what kind of like gambling is it? Sports. I gamble on a range of events, uh, obscure tennis matches at two o'clock in the morning. It doesn't matter if I can yeah. find some arbitrage or an angle to shoot on it. I'm going to, I'm going to fire against it. And it's okay. an interesting business because it's, it's very much player versus player. Right. So the books are constantly making adjustments to the sharp players uh, hmm. like myself. And so it's a game of cat and mouse. I'm constantly having to adjust my strategy because these books are, these books are kind of figuring out that there's a sharp player behind the scenes. And, uh, it's very interesting because it ends up with, you know, me having to conceal a lot of the action that I'm placing. Sometimes I have to intentionally book bets that are going to lose just to throw them off the tracks. So I'll have to literally sacrifice some Benjamins um, in the in the favor of, of hopefully in the future being allowed to continue to play with that book. So it's pretty interesting. So that yeah. is that is that the, the Benjamin Franklin disrespect right there? Or mm -hmm. is that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Nice. Exactly. So that's really that, that's wild. Um so you can't I guess it's a, I guess since it's all online or a lot of it's online today, it's really difficult to do it anonymously because eventually like it's like tied through bank accounts and things like that or is the, is that something the, you can the, do? The algorithms these companies spend a fortune on building software. They have analysts who are basically tracking all the action. And yeah. so they're able to, they're able through their own proprietary data. And I think they all share the same systems. Uh, a lot of these books are in, in you know, in uh, lockstep with one another and they kind of yeah. monitor, they monitor betting patterns and they'll shut you down if you're killing them week after week. I mean, they're running a business too. So they, they see a sharp player. They want to, they want to kill the action. And then you end up having to, you know, get other people to place action for you to the, the hard part at the stage that I'm at is not actually winning. It's how the fuck am I going to book the action? <laughs> how am I going to get this much action down in the game? How am I going to get a million bucks down on the Super Bowl? That's the, you. that's the, that's the logistical issue. That's wild that like, you're so good at it that the issue isn't winning. The issue is how can I get these books to taste, take my business? Exactly. Huh. And there's and and don't get me wrong. There's extreme downturns. I mean, I, it's this is not for the faint of heart. I there's I go six months sometimes of absolutely just hemorrhaging cash. But I know if I stick to my script on a long enough time scale, I can win that shit back in one day. I can make my whole year in just one day. Mm. That's wild. Yeah, I have a, a a family member who's super into that the the sports betting stuff. Like he's got like he and he's like a very smart guy, and he's built like this whole algorithm and stuff with his actuary friends and uh it's like you know dialed into finding i guess like um like props that haven't been uh i guess prop Im they're improperly weighted by the bookies um and so it's like do you have like a whole big software thing or is this something that's like more dialed into like instinct no i have a team of quants okay who we, we actually create our own data and then it, it's, it's very much a team sport, which is funny because I never I'm a solo guy. Yeah. And I tried I tried professional sports gambling solo for many years and I would go on huge runs and then burn it all because I didn't have the infrastructure in place to kind of mitigate that downside. So having a team is central. Like, no, p people can't do what I can do because they don't have the horses. You got to hmm. have horses. You got to have horses in the stable that all have different roles and like nobody has the skeleton key to the whole business. It's very compartmentalized. So nobody mm -hmm. can run, nobody can run off on me and replicate what I do because there's red tape. Like I'm the only one who can see every, every department. Yeah. And there's, there's wings. So everybody just plays their role perfectly and there's synergy there. That's awesome. 
that's a mm-hmm. that's an interesting way to to go about it. And you know, you, you talk about high stakes gambling. What does that mean? High stakes. So typically, I'm firing hundreds of thousands of dollars per day. Um, there's uh, sometimes my weekly um, margins, or I mean, sometimes I'm firing ten million a week in actual in actual bets placed. Wow. That's not just that's not deposits. That's just bets wagers placed. Um, huge events like Super Bowl and shit. It's not uncommon that I've had two million dollars on a game. Um, it's been extraordinary ups and downs and, and m- massive swings, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of shaped just my perspective of the whole world. I mean, you're when you're ga- when you're gambling at that level, even when it's a profession, you're you're tinkering with your fight and flight mechanisms. Oh yeah. That's what that's what you're really doing. So it's just that constant state of fight or flight. Um, and I mean, I relish that, man. I, I thrive in that environment. I'm always amped up. I'm always gassed up. It's it's a 24 hour gig. I mean, yeah. I'm I'm a de- I'm a I'm a delegator. I'm I gotta operate my guys and, and make sure everybody's playing their role at all times. And um, yeah, I I can't imagine an alternative. That's so interesting because, like, you know, a lot of uh, you know the the stuff that I do. You know, you're probably not super familiar with you know all my thing or whatever. But I started out helping guys like quit porn and. The way that I found like my truths that people find valuable is just like going to that like darkest place. Like, why am I doing this shit? Like, what is going on deep, deep inside? And in order to do that, it's like you need to be a certain level of of fucked up, really, to like have the environment where you can actually like run the reps to like it's like when you're trying to figure out how you work. The way I've always thought about it is like I'm a uh, I'm like a like cave explorer. It's like, but I dive inside the the self and you can't really see anything in there. And most people, they like step in there for a second, they freak out and they don't want to go back in. But like, if you just make your living down there, eventually you feel out the walls. You see, oh, this part's shaped like this. Oh, this path leads over here. And you start to build a map from it. And I see that's kind of like what you've done, uh, particularly with this, uh, fight or flight mechanism maybe we should call it it's like how to how to get fired up how to live at an exceptionally high like level of motivation right because you realize that the only way to get that is to be in a state of risk of challenge of discomfort because that's necessary to ignite the system but one and getting to that point is massively uncomfortable you know it's you got to be devastated so I imagine in your case, like the ups and downs, like, can you tell me about them? Like, what, what does it look like for you to, to be this all in gambler? Like what, what has this taken you through? I mean, you, you develop a very, very thick skin. Um, and you, you kind of understand that having this kind of low level amnesia is so crucial to success because in my game, you, you cannot afford to look at what happened five minutes ago. I mean, I, sometimes you do everything right and you just get destroyed. I mean, I've been, I've been beaten by every force in the universe imaginable. I've been beaten by the zebras, the refs. I've been beaten by late whistles, buzzer beaters. I mean, you name it, I've gotten wrecked uh, in the final seconds of, of many different types of showdowns. And I mean, just like poker, like you learn that you can't, you cannot look at what happened five minutes ago. It's irrelevant. You have to make the next right move regardless. And, and the thing that I've learned the most is that every state that I'm in, I view as an advantage. If I'm overstimulated, if I'm sad, if I'm depressed, if I'm in any state at all, I find that there's an advantageous way to play that game. Mm-hmm. I, don't see, I don't see any kind of uh, situation that I'm in that's not salvageable. Yeah. Because whatever I'm presented with uh, is just going to force me to be extremely resourceful. And, um, you know, it gives you an opportunity to respond to whatever that you're dealing with. So even if I'm in the lows of the lows, uh, I I draw strength from that and I'm able to uplift myself. Yeah. Yeah. I I totally hear what you're saying. Like for me, uh, the, the, I like, this it's this idea of everything that happens to me is the best possible thing that could ever happen to me. That's the way I try and look at it. And like, if you start look like it's a weird exercise at first, because the first thing people do is like, oh well, what if this bad thing happens or that bad thing happens and blah blah. And it's like, no, you don't get. It. I'm not making like, well, I guess 
on some level, I am making a metaphysical like statement. Like I do believe God uh, exists, and I do believe that uh, He wants the absolute best for you. The problem is He's brutal, and He will give you what you need, even if that's not what you want. And so the faith aspect of life is learning how to look at particularly those tragedies, particularly those horror horrific things, and saying, well, what if this was? the best possible thing that could ever happen to me. And you start playing, you, you make the space for that story to be true. And as soon as you do that, you start finding the angle. Is that kind of like what you're talking about here? Exactly. It's like, it, it's like corners. Whenever you're in a corner, like that's the opportunity for the most creativity. So when you're backed into a, when you're back, back is against the wall. I mean, primates love a good scrap, right? So like even the weakest animal when their backs against the wall is going to go for the jugular. So when, I, when my back's against the wall and I have a lot of pressure and I have to dig myself out of a hole, um, I, I'm inspired by that opportunity to fight. Mm. And so there's, there's just no state that I can be given that's ever going to pull me down because I'm always willing to take whatever I'm given. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely open to uh, receiving whatever it is that I'm going to receive. And, all, and I'm responsible for my actions. Well, I think so. I think you're right on, but I think there's like a spot that's like where where guys get hung up, like where they they fail to do that, which is there's also the flight mechanism, right? Like there's two sides to that coin. And a lot of guys, they don't they don't activate the fight side. They end up in that flight side where something bad happens and then they just disengage. They unplug. They they stop playing, right? They they don't they don't go for the jugular. They go belly up, right? What is it in you that you found that allows you to keep going with that fight mechanism? In, instead of cowering, you mean? Yeah. Um, it's just, dude, I have this ruthless optimism. Like I, I've never, ever, here's what I've realized the most. This is like the greatest epiphany that I've had in like maybe the last five years is that the opportunities that have passed you by are never, ever even close to as good as the opportunities that are still in front of you. Mm -hmm. And I've just found that to be true. It could be you've lost a woman that you loved. It could be that you lost a large sum of money, but I am thoroughly convinced that the opportunities ahead are always better than what's been, what's been left behind. Um, and so I've just kind of, that's my focal point. And that just gives me that strength. It endows me with that, that fighter instinct, that killer mentality. But again, I'm also extremely competitive. Yeah. I've always been, I've always had that competitive spirit since I was a young kid. Um, always have been a sore loser. When I would be losing in a video game when I was a teenager, I'd fucking turn off the console yeah. uh, against my friends. They'd get pissed off. Like, I've just always been a, a very emotional. I've always worn my heart on my sleeve in anything that I've done. Um, and I think that you have to be vulnerable to succeed. Because mm -hmm. to get what you to get what you w truly want requires you to wear your heart on your sleeve. You have to make it known. You have to put your chest out there like this is what I'm going for. And I understand that if I fail, it's going to hurt. And I, and so that, that ties back into your point. Cause I think a, the reason why a lot of people go by default into the flea mechanism is because they don't, um, they don't understand that. They don't understand that you, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Well, I think I know what you're saying there. It's like the the thing that I see, you know, I always try and bring things back to like what we under like, you know, you made some points about how science is gay and everything like that. But it does. I think it's, it's useful to me in some regard because it at least explains some mechanisms that then have utility. So, for example, the idea that you need certain things will only happen in your brain and your body under certain conditions. So for example, like wearing your heart on your sleeve. Yes, that means that you can get really hurt. But the thing about that is um, like, yeah, there's an opportunity to get good things too. But what's interesting about getting hurt is that that actually is what allows you to trigger some of your most real states, your most powerful states. Like you think about it, you're not going to build any muscle without inducing some trauma to the muscle, right? Same sort of thing I think happens to the human spirit is that if it's not <clears throat> hurt at all, then there's no stimulus to change. If you're comfortable, your your system's designed 
to just maintain it. It's like, oh, we're, we're winning. Oh, we're, we're jerking off to porn. That must mean we're, we're impregnating all these women. Oh, we're, uh, you know, in this comfortable scenario. Like, why would we, why would it give you any energy to change something if you're comfortable, right? And so it's like this, this all in mentality, uh, that I think guys are desperate to hear because they live, we live in a culture today that's just like, uh, comfort is God. It's like, why wouldn't you want to just go for this cushy lifestyle and do everything you can to like avoid risk and play it smart and, and all of these sort of things. But deep down in the masculine soul, that's like a death sentence. It's like, if you're not out there striving, conquering, taking risks, risks and doing things like that, then there's going to be a huge part of your being that is never ignited, never, never known. And so I, that's why I think your stuff is, uh, it connects with people because they feel that they know that they have this monster sleeping inside of them, but it, it needs something to poke it, something to, to wake it up. Yeah, it has to be prodded and goaded, like you said. And, and, and you reminded me of my point. What I was saying was, I think the reason why the people get couched in that, uh, that flea state is because they're actually pursuing things that they don't really want. So therefore, they're not wearing their heart on their sleeve because if they get rejected, if you lose an opportunity that you never really wanted in the first place, it just doesn't hurt. That's mm. why guys end up in relationships with women that they really can't stand. That's why guys are living, living with girlfriends that they don't really like because they know that if, if she leaves them or he gets cheated on, he's not going to really feel the sting because he doesn't really like that woman anyway. It just so becomes an go, excuse for him then almost. He's it like, oh, well, yeah, now I can get out of this. Exactly. And so you see guys intentionally self-sabotaging because they don't want to be, they don't want to make the first move, right? He's like the, 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 the real pandemic is you see guys like they will intentionally get fired from their job. They will intentionally yeah. sabotage relationships. So the girl leaves them. They don't want to yeah. do the leaving. They don't want to do the dumping. They don't want to be the one to quit the job. They want to get fired. So they they want to constantly react instead of creating the magic. Yes, exactly. I, I would agree with that. It's like there needs to be um, desire. I think so many guys, they try and operate from this place of should. I should do this. I should do that. I should do this. And that's all coming from, you know, right here, prefrontal cortex. The problem with that is that part of you, it doesn't control those neurochemicals that make you feel alive. That part's just like this, this logical reaction point. It's like if you want to feel on fire in life, it's got to come from someplace deeper, more primal. And sometimes those primal desires, like they don't, uh, they don't necessarily make sense. It's like you have to almost like like figure them out. You have to be willing to go on the adventure. And it's for someone who the people who are overly logical, I think it's uh, and that's is usually far more guys than girls who fall into the state. They end up like castrating themselves by by connect disconnecting themselves from these primal desires. What do you think of that? 100% dude, there's there's zero magic in the rational side of, of the human animal. Um, I everything all the serendipity any fortuitous event that's happened in my life has literally come when it's made the least sense so it, it, that's literally like my model of the universe like that's the, my op <laughs> my operating model is if i want something the less sense it makes the more likely it's gonna happen the less <laughs> rational sense it fucking makes dude like the the chances just accelerate that it's gonna fucking come true and the more sense it makes the less chance it's gonna happen Interesting. Can it's, you give me can you give me an example of that in your life? It's like the absurdity of going on these runs that I've had to do in, in, in professional sports betting. Like I, I have gotten absolutely eviscerated numerous times in my life. What's the most you ever lost? I lost in twenty nineteen before I was really on Twitter, I lost seventeen million in six months. Of, of my own money. Of oh my, my own money. And it's, it's incredible because when I lost it, I never once went back and, 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 and tried to like go through the muck and figure all I knew was that I was going to get it again. Mm -hmm. I just knew for a fact that like, that's, that's the mindset that I, that I woke up with the next morning. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. I woke up and I was like, all right, now I got to assemble the next run. I got to keep going and I'm going to be better and stronger for the next run. And so it's kind of that analogy of sometimes you got to go back to the base of the mountain and reclimb it when you have new wisdom and new new tools in your arsenal so that you can go back and face those same challenges, but you're just a better man this time. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, and, that, dude, that makes that makes zero sense, right? Like, it makes zero sense that a guy can lose seventeen million. And I wasn't suicidal. I was. It was actually the opposite. It was life affirming. It was life affirming that I'm going to go back and I'm going to go fix those mistakes and I'm going to avenge the past. And I think that's the masculine imperative: is not being bogged down by the past, but avenging whatever has happened to you. Mm, that's interesting. And this this brings up the uh, one of the other big things I really wanted to to talk to you about is you know that you, you talk about avenging and stuff and the 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 masculine imperative and how a man kind of re- reaches his uh you know potential you had a uh, twitter space that you ran on the champion mindset and maybe before i ask my question or i put forth my thought can you give people a little summary of like what that was about what you were talking about yeah, it was just about the sort of the dichotomous forces that that people play with in order to catapult themselves to, um, you know, extraordinary success that for an ordinary person would would deem unfathomable. And, and basically the summary of it was is that I was talking about how a lot of these people are motivated by very ugly, grotesque, uh, dark forces that a lot of people are afraid to peek into because yeah. it. it because a lot of this stuff is a lot of success when you peel off the veneer is very ugly. It's very, very ugly. It's not pretty. Um, it's, 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 it's almost horrifying to a degree when you look at the instruments and mechanisms that were utilized to get these people to these high states of, of being. So like what? Like you can get a guy who's been heartbroken for 25 years because his crush in third grade rejected him. Yeah. And now he's just on this, this Genghis Khan like crusade to just wipe everything out of his path. He's like almost driven by this like fury, but it's almost like this majestic kind of fury where he just, he wants to hack and slash his way through every single um, obstacle. And literally the fundamental thing in the back of his brain is just getting his comeuppance over a, over a simple rejection in, in fucking middle school. Right. Kind of like Michael Jordan, like, you know, getting cut in high school or something from the team and like how he carried that with him for forever. And he was constantly, mm-hmm. you know, like finding a reason to put a chip on his shoulder, a reason to get pissed off at someone. Right. Exactly. Now, exactly. in that talk, I thought it was also interesting. You know, you were mentioning guys like Tom Brady. You're like, hmm, he's kind of tapped into something a little bit different. Right. Like it doesn't seem like he's being driven by that animosity uh is, right. is, is, so i have a theory about like what that is and this is actually the thing that i've been obsessed with figuring out because it's like i i see what you're saying and i've always seen it and i've always been in touch with like that that killer instinct like that part that is drawn to darkness and violence I actually used to be a very violent kid like i i used to fight and beat people up and like just want to like Argh! you know it's just like part of who i was and Eventually, you know, like I, I lost a lot of that when I got dumped in eighth grade. Uh, but <laughs> speaking to your point, but the like where I'm at now is I, I view like that kind of combative force that is at the, the root of masculinity. Like the Greeks called this thumos. Are you familiar with that idea? It's like this, yeah. you know, this, this, this masculine sort of fire. And I, the most common way to generate that the way that seems most studied is this sort of dark side approach of like getting a chip on your whole, your shoulder, like become Machiavellian, like, you know, the, you know, Robert Greene's like 48 laws of power, like that whole style thing. But I was like, that just doesn't feel right to me. Like, I feel like there's gotta be another path to it. And like you said, there's other people who have seemed to tap into that. And to my best understanding what it comes down to is the way you view yourself. So ultimately, this is a mechanism of the ego. It's, it's, you have to be able to engage the ego in this way. And I think there's two ways to do it. One is to like feel like you are not good enough. Basically, you have to feel like you are nothing without this status, right? And it's like your job then is to earn it. It's like this, this idea of, perfect conditional worth where if I'm not the best, then I am nothing. I'm a piece of shit. And so like I'm on a war path to gain my worth. Would you agree with that? It's kind of like 100%. Okay. So the flip side approach is to decide that you are actually already perfectly good. 
And most guys, when they hear this, the first rejection is, well, if I'm already good, why would I do anything? And I think you got to take the concept all the way. It's like looking at yourself as like my nature is one of perfection. Like this is this is like, you know, as a Christian, that's 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 my idea is that, you know, God created us with this perfect divine spark. There's nothing we can fucking do to make ourselves worth any more as a human or worth any less as a human. But status still matters. So it's kind of like, you know, if my nature is good and like say like the nature of my finger is to bend like this. If I start going against it, it's going to hurt. Eventually it's going to break. And so really like where you derive that power from is looking at all these things beneath your dignity, beneath your divine dignity, your your kingly dignity as like uh an anathema, like like horror, like these things that must be rectified. It's kind of like you, instead of becoming this monster, this demonic monster who's on his war path, you become like the holy terror who's out to burn down all that is not in alignment with the highest good. What do you think of that? Yeah, I can roll with that for sure. I think what you're talking about is actually the integration of the animus. I mean, the anima, hmm. which is the which is the feminine. So. What you just said, and I think a lot of guys miss this, is to be a complete man, there has to be this integration process of, because you'll notice that a lot of very masculine men have an extremely, uh, they have an extreme feminine side. They're usually like extremely sensitive. Um, I've noticed this a lot. They like really hyper-masculine men love really fucking feminine music because it's kind of the yin and yang. And so Mm -hmm. what I've noticed is what you're talking about is because women are born complete. Right. Women know who they are from birth. They never question it. They just they never, (laughs) never question it. They never have to prove themselves like we have to prove ourselves with every erection, every (laughs) you know what I'm saying? Like everything we do is just a constant fucking proof of work. And so my only contention to that point, which what you're saying is extremely valid because that integration process is, is crucial. However, I do think men do need to sculpt and build, cut themselves out of limestone. Like you, you have to, um, you have to battle those forces and come to clash with like the grand finale of your own spirit in order to become the kind of person that you want to be. So, um, like knowing your innate worth is, is very much activating that kind of feminine side, which I think is, is extremely valuable. Hmm. Like, like I said, but it's, it, it's, does kind of stray from how I think men are molded because men constantly have to mold themselves from nothing, right? Like that's the alchemical process. But then the what question, are, what, are, but the, what, the, what are your thoughts on that? I think it comes back to the why, right? Like if you, if you, if you know your inner worth, okay, I still think that's going to take you to the crucible probably like art just in a different way. It's like, cause if you take it, like a lot of guys, they take, they, they, they approach that idea of inner worth as a, a scapegoat it's like oh i fucked that thing up so oh it's okay i'm still good i still love myself and it's just like this it's like this excuse that allows them to to wipe away the guilt and things like that and on some level you need to have self forgiveness or else you're just going to you're literally never going to move forward cuz it's like the way i see it is like you need to have some justification to sacrifice Right. And so from this vacuous mentality of being this monster, your justification to sacrifice is because if you don't, you're a piece of shit. You fucking suck. You're you're worthless. Okay, but the flip side is if you view yourself as so good, then you have to sacrifice for yourself. Otherwise, you don't really think you're that good. Right. It's like it's about like and if you do that, then you're, you're put into conflict with all the pieces of your life where your status is beneath your dignity. And the problem is, I think most guys, they, they take this self-worth con- concept only just like, you know, they, they dip a toe into it. If you go all in on it, then I think it'll take you to the same crucible, the same intensity that the one you're talking about prior does. But most guys, like just like for the other path, they just don't have the fortitude for it. They're just looking for an easy way out. As soon as they get comfortable, they disengage, they unplug. But if you, like, at, at, it's kind of like at the end of the day, you got to become some kind of maniac if you want to find your yourself as a man. It's either you have to go all in on, like, total worship of the the ultimate good, or you have to just go all in on the total worship of your, like, 
maximal pleasure. Or maybe it's even the same fucking thing. It's just about, are you good already or are you earning the goodness? It's kind of just, it ends up activating the same sort of pathways in your brain and in your body. It's just, what worldview are you in? Are you sucking all the way to the top? Or are you good and then fighting this like crusade to regain your throne like in reality? It's kind of like, you know, the return of the king archetype where you've got this guy who's, you know, living beneath his status, but he has this kingly nature and it's his job to go on this crusade to have his worldly status reflect that inner dignity. It's like either that or you're the guy who's just, you know, sucks and you just become a warlord uh, through through force of will and dominance. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it, see, in my experience, I think it's very important that healing comes at the end of the story, not the beginning. And a mm. lot of guys, a lot of guys want to heal uh, before they've had any accomplishment or any success. And I think that's a huge mistake because when you have a fully mended heart, you lose that luster and you lose that drive to attack. So my whole thing is it's better to keep moving forward in a mangled fucked up state almost that neuro neurosis that you're talking to because once i achieve what i set out to do and once i get that big win then i can focus on healing but you know what i'm saying like if i get a huge fucking score and i make a, a ton of money in a year then i can start going to the sauna start meditating get massages start doing that deep inner work because i won i won my war now i can focus on healing the damage that it took to get to where i'm at and I find that a lot of guys have that process reversed. They want to fix every little minutia, every little character flaw before they've even entered the game. And then you lose that edge. You're, you're, hmm. you're a dull butter knife. Yeah, I think I think you're you're onto something there. I don't know if it's so much the the order of the kind of work. It's more just about like what is what is the thing that is actually right for you? Like like if the man, if a man is not following his highest conception of goodness, then what is he following? Like, I'm just thinking like, you know, not to co contradict your point, but just to put a, an alter, like, like a scenario. So say there's a guy who's got like a drug addiction or something like that. And his finances are a wreck and all that kind of shit. It's like, he probably doesn't need to go like win a financial war first before he can heal himself. He, his war might be going to like a fucking detox center or something like that. And so like, Yes, I agree with you. The answer is not to sit in a therapist's office like examining your past for, you know, a decade to try and figure out how to move forward. The, the answer is set a big fucking juicy goal that gets you pumped up and then go after it with every single thing that you have. And that process in and of itself is a spiritual sort of thing. It takes you to a place. Like I'm sure you know you're you're a big lifter and everything. And it's like there's there is a spirituality to the barbell. There's a, like when you push yourself to the limits, you're going to start finding things inside of yourself, whether it's in the gym, at work, you know, with your family, whatever it is, you have to be really striving towards something that you truly want. And anything other than that is a cope. 100 percent. 100 percent. I've always viewed excellence as the most ethical form of spirituality. Hmm. When people tell me they're spiritual. I'm like, okay, well, where's your body of work? Like, what are, what are, where, where are you standing out? Where's your excellence? Because that pursuit is extremely illuminating. Like you, you don't need to study self-help books. You don't need to embark on like reading the Bhagavad Gita, in my opinion, like the, the pursuit of excellence is going to teach you everything you would have read in those books anyway. Yeah. The pursuit of excellence is a lot of time. It's just this, uh, it's this masturbatory escape. And I know this firsthand because like looking back at my life, I didn't understand this until actually really recently. I actually commented on one of your tweets. You said something about like all, all guys, you know, jacked up problems has something to do with some rejection from a woman or something along those lines. And on and I was commenting about how like a few months ago I had, I was just like exhausted from this like day of work and I was just like sitting in a chair and then all of a sudden, Boom, I remember this time I got dumped when I was 14 by this girl I was like, you know, super into. And um, it like, it was before I did any self-development work. And so like, I basically just straight repressed it. That's part of the reason why it was still floating around there. And what I realized looking back then, like that's when I got super obsessive about self-development. I was that guy who, who read every self-development book. And the reason was because I didn't want to get hurt again. 
it was it was it was a a defensive mechanism of me like you know peeling like like pulling back from the world i used to be kind of like this young sort of naturally alpha dude very popular you know i was actually in 7th grade she was in 8th grade and then she was going to high school and that's why she dumped my ass uh and but then after that i came like you know more withdrawn and everything and my my whole mo was like how can i become perfect before i go back out into the world so i never get hurt again and you know it all worked out because uh, you know that knowledge ended up serving me all that shit that i learned but it wasn't actually the path right the the path is when you're doing something you're actually out there driving striving and, and making stuff happen no doubt so <coughs> sorry just ranting on you here um <laughs> the uh i wanted to ask you about in this high stakes gambling stuff um is there a kind of like, do you approach that with any sort of like spirituality or, or like, you know, uh, like there's a lot of guys who look at, who are into the, the gambling stuff and they're very superstitious. They're like, you know, really into like, Oh, lady luck and all that kind of shit. How do you approach it? Um, I try to remove as much superstition from my life as possible. Hmm. Um, I don't, uh, if anything, like I'll intentionally break a mirror, walk under a ladder and I'll fucking hold the black cat in my arms while I'm placing a bet because I'm here to prove that force of will, um, force of will has just been the most powerful force that I've ever grappled with. I've pulled myself up out of enough spots in my life to, to realize that, um, the boons of the universe come from within. Like the universe isn't just going to bring anything to your doorstep. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really uh, contentious towards that attitude. Um, so no, I mean, there's, there's zero superstition in my life. If anything, I will goad and beckon the universe to bring, bring as much fucking chaos on me as possible, because mm -hmm. I'm gonna fight. I'm gonna fight back. So it's like I, I don't, <laughs> I don't like. Um, hanging my coat on any sort of um and it's funny because it, it, i am a metaphysical guy like there's a lot of metaphysical instruments that i do believe in but a lot of those forces i think are just unconscious like a lot of people have self-fulfilling prophecies that they make come true from deep within them and then they'll blame that on the universe but it's like that's coming from unconscious places you know the cabinetry and furniture in your head the way it's arranged like mm. that has a massive impact on the outcomes of things. So I'm my my whole shtick, even in my gambling, is I want to understand the underpinnings of human behavior. So I'm I'm only interested in the unconscious mind hmm. because it's just such a powerful driver. And it's like I've seen so many people acting out and lashing out in ways that they don't even understand because right. that those Thonian forces are so fucking powerful. So what are the, you know, for the, the average guy today, what do you see as some of the biggest unconscious forces that are holding him back? Uh, I think a lot of guys love cashing in on being a victim. Uh, I think a lot of guys intentionally fail and fall in love with the process. Uh, and they forget that the process is designed to ultimately make you win. And so I think a lot of guys intentionally fail because they just enjoy the rigmarole of going through whatever process it is. And hmm. so it's like, you know how people say, like, you got to love the process, forget about the destination. Yeah. I don't agree with that. I think the destination is extremely important, uh, you know, to keep your eyes on the prize. Otherwise, you just see these guys get mired in a concentric circle where they're constantly spinning their wheels in the mud and they, they can't understand why they continually fail. But they're doing it on purpose because it, it's like a pressure valve. It takes the pressure off. Um, to have low expectations, because when you fail year after year after year, eventually everybody's just going to turn their back on you because that's your calling card. Now they're like, all right, well, this guy's 35. He still doesn't have his life together. And I think guys kind of like that. They kind of want to be alienated. They kind of want people to uh, turn their back. Um, Stop I've having had expectations. hundred percent. I've had this, this extremely profound insight that I think is very true about porn. And I think that I think guys descend into the most bizarre genres of porn um, and things like that after they've had some huge disappointment in their life. So yeah. I think a lot of guys will engineer a massive disappointment where they feel shame and then they, they take that shame and that's when they start, you know, viewing porn and viewing these like very bizarre genres 
because it reinforces that they're a piece of shit. Oh yeah. And so they're, it, it totally reinforces that. And so people are constantly looking to reinforce what they believe about themselves. Yeah. There's, there's some interesting things to, to talk about with that. Like in my work as like professionally helping guys like quit their porn problems and stuff like that. One of the things that I've seen is that particularly with like a lot of the fetish stuff, what guys are doing is they're trying to take something that is psychologically painful for them and take back control and make it pleasurable. So for example, you know, I've had guys who are really into financial domination or something like that, where they're, they'll like, you know, basically they, they just get off on having to like blow all this money on women. Um, or they'll, they'll, uh, have it where it's like the, they just need to be, you know, some other kind of like domination sort of thing. And really what they're trying to get at is the insecurity that they feel ultimately, like they feel insecure. Like I'm, I'm powerless in this, like I'm powerless in money or I'm powerless with women. And so they take that and they're like, well, this porn lets me turn that powerless feeling into sexual pleasure, right? It's like, oh, if you just, you know, treat me like a baby or whatever, and you treat me like a naughty little boy, that takes that part of me that's disgusted with the fact that I'm behaving so immaturely, and it lets me turn it into pleasure. It's like, it's like a, a sick coping mechanism for uh, their, their deficiencies that they're not willing to look at. 100%. It's like what it is, it's almost like you you can't hit rock bottom if you just keep lowering your standards. <laughs> so these guys are just, they could, they lower their standards continuously. So they never actually have to hit bottom. And then all of a sudden one day you wake up and you're jerking off to midget porn. That's how, <laughs> that's how bad it gets because also th that, that genre of porn, like let's be honest, a midget in society is such a undesirable creature, right? Yeah. So these guys are, these guys are deriving pleasure from the imagined them being desired by an undesirable creature. Yeah. Which reinforces that shame mechanism. It's 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 fucking fascinating. Man. It is because like it's the shame mechanism itself that creates the high. It's like the fact that they're doing something taboo, it like in, injects the the experience with like this weird octane that like that's where they start getting fucking hooked on it and stuff. But to to go back to your progress about how guys will like self sabotage and they'll just like, you know, keep themselves like caught in this pattern. I've seen that with guys quitting porn because what ends up happening is they'll start trying to quit. They'll get like real motivated, like, oh, I'm improving my life. They'll make great progress, right? They'll actually like, you know, go 90 days or whatever it is, but they don't set any new goal, right? It's like they, they, they're, they're afraid of taking that step again. And so they're just like, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna run a rerun here. I'm just gonna relapse, go on a bender. And then I can get that feeling of building myself back up again. And this time I get to do it in a thing that I've already handled. I'm familiar with it. And they, they get it, they get addicted to the, the do redoing the same climb. It's kind of like me when I was like a, a little kid, I would play like these video games and you know, they would scare me. I was like, Oh, this is scary. This is hard. And once I beat a level, I would just like go back through it and play it again instead of playing the next level. Cause I was like afraid of it. Do you see any of that in guys? 100%. I think that's like the biggest, I think that's the biggest thing is, is like you said, it's like I beat this demon before, so now I'm going to beat it again. And it gives you this sort of artificial sense that you're actually overcoming something, but you're not, it's right. you're, you're, you know what I mean? Like you're just, <laughs> you're spinning your wheels in the mud. Like we just said. Right. So how do you, uh, how do you personally m keep your brain constantly looking forward and not replaying the same levels? Man, I'm constantly loading things on my plate that I can't handle. Um, I take on a lot of I take a lot of shoulder load on things that I'm that I feel that I'm unqualified for. Um, I don't really like preparation. I just like to to dive into stuff, and I'm kind of like an escape artist. Like I'll, I'll put myself through severe challenges and gauntlets, and then the, the fun for me is just kind of fighting my way out and being autodidactic and just learning as I go. That's been a very valuable uh, instrument for me. So like a guy will hit me up, maybe he wants to borrow a quarter million dollars for a venture. I stop him right there. I don't even want to know what it's for. If it's a guy I grew up with, I'm just going to throw him the money because I just want to see, I just want to see where the fuck this is going to go. You know, I just, I want to be involved. I want to have my hands in so many different tills um, so that I can just kind of push myself mentally and constantly have um, just kind of some hope or some faith in, in just the future. Yeah. 
that's, I think that's pretty much all you can do is like, there's, there has to be a, a fundamental curiosity, right? It's like, you have to be more curious than you are afraid. That's what I found. It's like, if you're like, if you're not willing to be curious about, well, what could happen if I took this different path, right? Then all you see is, is risk and potential failure, right? Like there, you have to be able to create that space of like, well, something really cool could happen here. And I kind of just want to see it. I I'm willing to go on a, an adventure, even if that adventure like doesn't lead to the typical payoff, the adventure itself is kind of like worth the process, right? It's like, uh, on one hand, I guess, see if you can synthesize this for me, because you were talking about how you don't want to be uh, the guy who is just falling in love with the process. But it also sounds like what you were just saying there is that you're really interested in the process in the adventure, even if you're not certain where it's going to go. So how do you how do you reconcile that? I'm, I'm more interested in the challenges because I, I'm not afraid of loss at all. Um, that, that's what it is for me. It's not necessarily the process. It's the fact that I know whatever the outcome is, is going to be advantageous for me because I'm going to use that as ammunition and fuel. So it's like, mm -hmm. I can literally put myself in any kind of position because that, that's, that's actually the circle back. Like that's what I think the masculine imperative is. It's, it's being willing to see and go to places that other men are unwilling to go so that you can extract that wisdom and bring it back to the community, bring it back to your children. And it's like, if you're a man and you're unwilling to uncover these stones and go to these extreme places, you're not going to, you're not going to learn anything that's unordinary. And I, I just want to learn unordinary things about life. So by, by putting these huge burdens on my shoulders, I'm able to go into these mental states that are, that are very unusual. And I'm able to kind of play in there and kind of figure things out. So for me, it's, it's an extraction method for wisdom. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in a deep search for wisdom and truth at all times. Yeah. Particularly I, in how it relates to me. Right. Right. Of course, which would make the most sense. And so it's like what you're, what you're saying is that you're not focused entirely on the, the superficial wins and losses, right? Like you're willing to blow a shitload of money if it brings you some sort of emotional or spiritual advantage, right? It's that's like exactly, you, that's exactly right. It's not, I, I don't care truly about the money at the end of the day I, <clears throat> at all. I really don't. Um, I care about my, my strength. Like I view my connection to God as the knowledge and wisdom of my own strength. Like for me, that's my pipeline. That's when I feel that sort of divine provenance and that, that governorship of a higher force is when I'm uh, in, in deep search of that. Right. I, I've heard you, I think it was in that, that champion mindset, you're talking about how you've never felt like, like more like the will of God or the, the connection with God than when you were operating the most intensely upon your own will. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's kind of like, go ahead. It, it, it feels um, it feels like the closest metaphysical force that I've able, ever been able to grapple with. Like it appears that it's it's that it's supernatural, the feeling, right. because you can because you're just bending reality constantly. But that only kicks in if you're pursuing like the highest thing that you can tap into is that right like if you're doing something that you know is kind of like holding back or playing it safe do you find that same feeling no not at all right for me for me it's about playing for high stakes and i think this is where a lot of guys also make mistakes is like in life at some point you have to realize that you have to sit at the table with the big boys and raise the ante if you want anything to happen i think a lot of guys get in this vicious cycle of constantly playing for low stakes like their whole thinking is oriented on small numbers, small gains, everything's very minimized and diminished. And that becomes a very strange addiction. Like at some point you do have to pony up and, and raise the stakes if you want to get to the next level. And I think a lot of guys are afraid to take that step. Yeah, it's, it's for sure. It's, and that's the thing is like, that's the next level is, is playing bigger and bigger. So, okay. I want to, I want to shift topics here a little bit. Uh, I'm loving this stuff, but uh, you've had some very interesting things to say about science. You know, we kind of alluded to that in the beginning. So why is, why is science gay? Dude, science is gay because what I've seen is that a lot of the dudes who are peddling it um, are doing so as sort of like gatekeepers. Like 
that they get obsessed with like learning this 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 extremely kind of like avant-garde vocabulary which kind of makes you feel like you're an outsider and then the focus is just on pure materialism like these guys are literally telling you that you that you're fucked up because your fucking hypothalamus is is not functioning correctly or you're um you know you need to take testosterone injections or trt and like what i found is that when you focus on those external um when you kind of focus when you, when you make your focus about things like that you you've removed your agency you've removed um kind of the human spirit it's a way of i think it's kind of like anti-human in a way you're, you're you're not focused on the right things you're not um because here's the problem right if you're focused on hormone optimization and you're focused on let's say like injecting testosterone like that's a huge science on our corner of twitter that everybody's obsessed with right you're you might you might have extraordinary physical gains and turn into a mutant physically but your brain will be left behind Right. There's no there's no injection or supplement you can take that's going to give you the metacognition that you need to be successful. And the, the mind, the mindset of a winner is way more rare than the muscles. Right. So I find that it's just a complete inversion kind of uh, and cause, because science is geared towards that kind of like human performance is all in the physical. But what about the brain? Like your brain is just going to be a straggler as you've gained these fucking monster, uh, you know, muscles like. Right. It's kind of like, that's, I think, good. Yeah. No, I just think that's a huge mistake. I think that um, they have to work in, in uh, you know, they have to dovetail. Like those two mechanisms are, are not unconnected. And so to have a strong mind, you need a strong body and vice versa. And when you neglect one without the other, I think you create a lot of fucked up men. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's just, it's just the shortcut mentality, I think. Like, I think you could make a similar argument for uh, psychedelics. But instead of like, uh, you know, physical strength, we're talking about like maybe spiritual insight. If you gain spiritual insight through living at your limit, like pursuing your highest good, like what we've been talking about, the spiritual insights that you get from that, they will be fully integrated. They will be, you know, part of, of your being. If you get it from like some like trip to the jungle and an ayahuasca trip, uh, yeah, there's going to be something there in the same way that a guy who does, you know, steroids, he's going to have some real physical strength, but it, I don't think it's going to be fully integrated. Uh, it, there, there has to be, like, there's an honest way to go about acquiring this kind of deeper knowledge and, and deeper power. And uh, when you're talking about the science stuff, it's like everybody wants to deconstruct things and part of i think what's so attractive to me about like your your thinking is that you go the other way instead of like boiling it all down to oh it's your hypothalamus and amygdala and shit like that it's like well yeah maybe those things are happening but like what does that mean on the bigger picture like what if we zoom the camera back instead of in what does it mean that this part gets triggered when you're in an intense situation? What does it mean that this happens like you're, you know, when your heart breaks under this scenario and you have to do X, Y, and Z to build yourself back up? It's like this, we, that's what I think spirituality is. It's like looking at the nature of reality and building a bigger story about it rather than just trying to compartmentalize everything in these little hackable pieces. Exactly. It's the whole over optimization uh, mentality that that, that 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 kind of scientific reasoning kind of fosters this guys don't even have 98 percent figured out and they're still trying to optimize for that last one percent. It's like, dude, that those one percent, two percent benefits from over optimizing only only create excellence in people who have the other 98 percent figured out. You haven't even started yet and you're obsessed with your fucking testosterone levels. <laughs> so you're but saying dude, that like. <laughs> why do I see a bunch of fat motherfuckers who are obese and have a shit diet? Why are they running circles around you? Like I can just walk out my front door and I can see this happening. I see people who would probably draw very dead on a testosterone reading on a blood test. And they're, they're probably much more high powered and successful than a lot of these dudes who are op over optimizing. And, and my, my other counterpoint to the thing is, is if testosterone is so such the holy grail and so important why are the meatheads not in power why are the meatheads not making policy and legislation in the government why are they just walking around with big water jugs all day and most of them don't even have a fucking job like the guys <laughs> from my vantage point who are running the country are skinny dweeb looking dudes 
yeah who probably are, are very low on testosterone so it's a it's a more i have a more spiritual spiritualistic holistic approach there's something there's some intangible force going on there that is creating success in people rather than like you said f- making it modular and granular and focusing on these little constituents yeah and i think social media plays such a huge part in that because it's like you know you want the abs you want the six pack and that's what's being promoted as like the manly thing and then it's like <sighs> It's like, oh, so I, I guess I gotta like, hold on, I gotta figure out my schedule. I gotta, I gotta like, uh, sun my balls at noon, and then I have to like, you know, make sure I, I, I go to Whole Foods and get my plastic free, like, you know, bullshit. And it's just like these, these kind of accounts, like. I've been kind of, you know, I, I've found myself sucked into them, like following them, and they just keep telling me, oh, you can't wear, you can't wear uh, clothing with with polyester in it. It's going to lower your tea. Uh, you have to make sure you sun your balls five times a day. Oh, you can only eat this, this, and this. And I'm just like, oh, uh, is this stuff killing me? And it's just like, guys, they're just not, they're, they're missing the point that testosterone, I think you said it best, it's an as needed hormone, right? So say a little bit more about that. Like what, under what kind of circumstances does your body really start pumping testosterone? Well, it's like this. I mean, if you're a guy who, who, who works in a fucking cubicle all day under artificial light and you're crunching numbers, let's say as an accountant, eventually, honestly, like long term, your body realizes that you don't need perfect vision anymore. You don't need it. It'll, your body will start to remove things that you don't need. That's how I see the degradation of eyesight. That's how I see the degradation of any kind of physical structure and ailment. I see as your body no longer needs this, so it's going to take it away from you. But if you're in that hunter kind of predator philosophy of, let's say, an entrepreneur hunt, you know, eating what you kill every day, you're in a tough sales position or whatever for your work, your your that your body is going to respond to the need at hand. Right. Like, I mean, it's obvious, like, look at all the guys who end up wearing spectacles and glasses. It's all the guys that are stuck indoors all day getting kicked around in a cage. But the guys that are out there slinging, wheeling, dealing tussling with nature battling these forces like they don't have that kind of degradation so you just look in nature and it's it's interesting and, and your environment's everything like why would your body give you high testosterone if you're sitting in a fucking cubicle all day right it's just obvious to me that it's gonna it's gonna take it away from you right yeah and that's that's what it seems like is that the the more you are engaged in behaviors that testosterone would be beneficial for like risk conflict, you know, uh, conquest, all that kind of stuff, the more tea you're going to get. Right. And so it's without that. Uh, and, and maybe it's maybe maybe just focusing on tea is oversimplifying because it feeling is. on fire is it's a it's a neurochemical cocktail. Yes, testosterone exactly. is a part of it, but there's all other kinds of shit going on there, like vasopressin, endorphin, like adrenaline, like all those kinds of things. And really, that's what you're looking for is you're looking to to be able to start like optimizing that and the only way you do it it's not through some like biohacking shit it's about living on your purpose full blast like like no holding back right no training wheels like you're really going hard for it and i I, from what i found is that the one thing you you may need and maybe you'll disagree with me on this is that you need like other men around you to support you in the process especially if you're coming from a place of of instability what do you think of that um i i I do think that that is critical for sure it's a critical component um i'll tell you something interesting though i i've always found this very weird again just obeying the laws of nature because i look to nature to, to get all my philosophy Um, I always found it strange when men are going out publicly and traveling in large packs with other men. That's never been something that's interest, like interested me. I've never had a desire to be in an ecosystem with 10 other dudes. I think there's a lot of elusiveness and hiding in that. It's kind of like how herd animals and prey travel in packs to create the, the ambience that they're a stronger unit to ward off predators. Um, I've always kind of, I think the tight knit circle is, is absolutely critical. Um, like you said, like it makes more sense to be roving around with maybe two, two or three guys at the most, like a tripod, right. For stability. Um, I feel like, I feel like what it, what it is, is kind of like you at the very least, what you need is 
like-minded guys to call you on your shit and to continue to, to, to hold the mentality that you want when your conditioning and fortitude is not able to hold it on its own. So like, it, it's kind of like this, uh, you know, we are pack animals, right? Like we are not designed to be, you know, lone wolves, you know, we're kind of like chimpanzees or dogs. We almost have like the, the same limbic system. And when you, like when you're, when it's just you, it's so easy to bullshit yourself. It's so easy to like tell yourself that, uh, ah, it's okay if I just let this slide or, ah, it's okay if I just, you know, dip back into this bullshit that's, that's been holding me back. But like when you know that there is a pack of other people, of other guys that you respect and you're going to have to tell them and, you know, they're going to kind of kick your ass a little bit and, you know, try and bring you back. It's like just that knowledge that like there's someone else involved. It just seems to activate an additional like layer to your brain. Like one of the things I started doing with, uh, you know, the community I run is daily accountability where I am telling them every single day, you know, what I'm doing with the business, how I'm making it grow. And just the fact that I know that that's the case and I know that I'm not going to lie it just forces me to not bullshit myself. It's almost like you need other people. At least this is what I found in myself is that you need other people with eyes on you in order to to really live most authentically because we're so good at mental sleight of hand. Interesting. Interesting. I've, I've had kind of a different approach. Like I have definitely dudes around me that are extremely wicked, intelligent, wicked, strong, but we all kind of... Um, I don't want to say call each other out, but like you, you definitely need guys that you don't have to game. Does that make sense? Guys who like you can put down your guard and you don't have to have these little, cause anytime you're in an interaction with someone, there's like a little game being played. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's, it's refreshing to have like a group of dudes you can have an honest conversation with and you don't have to, you don't have to big time them. You don't have to worry about power dynamics or power structures right. because there's no mask. There's no masks being worn. You can kind of have that vulnerability. Um, that's been instrumental in my life for sure. Yeah. The, that, that, vul- that vulnerability sort of idea to me is an interesting one. Um, it's like women in particular like to talk about how guys like need to become vulnerable. And a lot of times when they say that, that means that they want men to become vulnerable to them. <laughs> and I, I'm I am not a fan of that. I don't think that guys can learn how to become a man or be their 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 best version of their self while answering primarily to women. Cause like what women are gonna promote, what they are going to even like subtly, like unconsciously incentivize, disincentivize, it's gonna be entirely through their feminine framework. And the bottom line is that we're, we're built different. The way that a man has to live in order to optimize his relationship with his own biology is different than a woman's going to have to, right? And so like, if you're only answering to women and their frame, especially being vulnerable to them, all of a sudden, like you, you're just playing, you, you're gonna be finding yourself playing a game that you cannot win because making, like, making their happiness the priority or, or letting their imperative become the way you order or organize yourself is just setting you up to to play a game that's incompatible with who you are as a man. And so it's like tapping into that with other guys, uh, that does seem to be uh, pretty essential. Absolutely. Especially when it comes to pushing each other, like even in this conversation, right? Like I'm, I understand that I'm participating in this because I'm also sharpening my blades. Like having this discussion is for sure polishing, uh, you know, my communication, the way that I see things, so, I mean, I'm, I'm always willing to take opportunities to kind of just sharpen the sharpen the, the tip of the spear. If that makes sense. Yeah. That's but all what's can... interesting. And I wanted to comment on what you just said is um, when it comes to being vulnerable, like a lot, a lot of the destruction that I see that has risen out of the red pill thing is a lot of guys want to pretend to be cool hand Luke all the time around women, or they want to pretend like everything's just supposed to slough off their shoulders. Nothing bothers me. I'm not going to address anything. And I have had dynamite like success doing the exact opposite. Like I have a radical policy of addressing every fucking thing that bothers me. I'm going to nip it in the bud right then and there. doesn't matter if it's a woman, a man, I will not pretend for even fucking one second to be comfortable when I'm not comfortable. And 
it's funny because that flies in the face of the red pill, but the women genuinely appreciate it when you set things straight right away. I do not wait. If something's going on that needs to be addressed, I'm not going to sit in that awkward state trying to pretend to be Mr. Cool Hand Luke for, like I said, even two seconds, because that's not me honoring my integrity. And right. it's funny because people will, the average person listening to that would be like, oh, well, that sounds like insecurity. It's the exact opposite. I'm so secure within myself that I have to constantly honor and I am relentlessly defending my integrity and my honor. So I have to call these things out and address like, I believe in addressing fucking everything with communication, everything right. that is bothering you. I think yes. that that's like, that it's a cornerstone for really strong, powerful relationships. And so I just think, yeah. What, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? I think that uh, you're a hundred percent right. I am the, the exact same way. I, I definitely haven't always been that way. It was almost like I had to get beat up a fair amount first. Cause like, you know, we have this, especially like, you know, as I was saying, coming from this like self development or like mindset where I just have to kind of be better. And it's like, I was like, oh, I got always trying to mimic a certain template of operation. But what I've come to kind of understand is like what women, and I think men, just people in general, what they do not like is, or what they find unattractive is someone who is acting like inauthentically. And mm -hmm. by that, I mean, is like, they feel one thing, they, they say another thing, right? Like women don't like it when you are fake. And we can tell because you, when you're being real, the vitality just flows out of you, right? It, it just, it comes out like you can, it's a palpable thing. It's something that we can, you can feel it. You can, it's, it's a, you know, as long as you're not like dead inside. And so when people start acting, right, like that, that whole cool hand Luke uh, thing you're talking about there, that's just like little kids LARPing at pretending they're more mature than they are. Right. And it just becomes, it becomes this, this, this silly thing when in reality, it's like what people really want is a person who's free. That is the most, I think, compelling thing to any person. It's like, Part of what like you know what attracted me to to your work is like you said stuff that most people don't say because they're afraid to say it and you just do it because you feel free. It's authentic to you. It's not like this this artificed thing that you know that that you're doing to game the system, right? It's like not like oh if I say this thing it'll be kind of controversial and that'll get me more views or whatever. It's like you can tell that the, it's coming from someplace more natural, and I think that I think that's what it is. It's like you know, it pisses me off that that's the, that's the best I can articulate it. Cause it's like, Oh, be yourself. But like, I'm trying, it's some, some concepts are like so simple that you have to make them like more complex to even like understand them. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. It's like, but then again, like there's the flip side to that coin where, um, we talk about, we, you want to talk about like identity maintenance and being true to yourself. Right. Like I think people don't understand how relentlessly, you have to be on the ball and sharp at all times to defend who you are and like your identity. Like for me, it is a 24 hour rigorous, vigorous process. I'm inspired by it because people are constantly going to attack your truth. Like that's just what people, that's what people are designed to do to test it. Right. Yeah. It's like, so, like shit test constantly. Like, is he for real? Does he really, is this really who he is? Or like if I, yeah, constantly. And like, I love, wrestling with that like i have i will do whatever it takes to win um to a, almost like a pathological degree like you want to talk about that that drive to win like i'll tell you a good story um my my ex-wife she we were playing a game of chess one night and i had beaten her like a hundred games in a row we were doing like timed games it was it was a joke i was just i was just kind of stoking the fires having a good time messing around she couldn't beat me and then I started to get really lackadaisical and I started to get off my game because I got cocky and I was like, this is just too easy. So I'm fucking around on my phone. I'm making random moves. And this happened to not be a timed game. And I got myself completely backed against the wall where like in three moves I was toast. And so you want to talk about identity maintenance and this just ruthless desire to just win at all costs. Um, I decided that I wasn't going to take the concession. Like there was no way I was going to sit here and allow her to beat me in this game. So I sat back on the couch, lit up a cigarette, and I just simply refused to move. I simply just refused to move my pieces. 
because I was like, if I just starve her out and basically put an embargo on her, I know she's just going to end up quitting. She's going to get so frustrated because that was me creating my own frame. I wanted right. her to, to get sucked into my frame that I am unwilling to accept that this was a true loss. So if I just starve you out, eventually you're just going to get frustrated and quit. And that's exactly what happened. But the interesting thing there psychologically is she wanted that to, to occur. She wanted to make the concession herself. Like she wanted to, to experience that. And I created the opportunity for that to happen to where mentally she could still justify that I actually did win that game. Again, people would look at that ruthlessness to win and be like, that's insecure. It's the opposite. Because I was feeling like that was my most true identity is that I am unwilling to concede this particular game. And if I have to, I will sit on the couch for seven <clears throat> straight hours until she quits. I'm like, there's no chance that I'm not even going to take a piss. I'm going to sit here until she quits. <laughs> and like that drive, dude, is what I'm talking about of cultivating that sort of identity maintenance. Like people don't understand that there's guys out there that are willing to go to those absurd lengths. Like that is absurd on the face of it. But that but think about how far that mentality can take you if you apply that to other stuff. Well, that's exact. like I've come to that same kind of idea and I call it the, the idea of like playing a bigger game. It's like if you're about to lose on one level, you just have to play a bigger game. Right. And so it's like what you did was you shifted frame from playing this little stupid chess game to just like, oh, I'm actually playing the game of our relationship. Here's how I like maintain like my frame as like the man who is, you know, the leader who is, you know, on top. You can't beat me. And so I'm just we're just we're, we're not playing chess anymore now. I'm playing a bigger game. And exactly. yeah. And that's something that I think a lot of people, they don't they don't get. They will like this is this is why machismo or being alpha or whatever can be so misunderstood and it can be so fucking bad when people don't know what's going on. Like if the guy actually thinks it's about the chess game and he starts doing stuff like that, then he is just a little, he's a little pussy. He's a little exactly. baby. Dude, exactly. It wasn't about the chess game. There's like a meta game here. It was like, I was being inauthentic playing the game because I wasn't being my ordinary competitive self. So I had to rein it in and bring it back to the macro and, and start making a life lesson out of it. Like right. now, now, now the game is life. It ain't chess anymore. That's why I'm willing to defend my honor as, as that I did not lose that game because that's just a metaphor for how I view my life. Like I am willing to do, to go to egregious lengths to protect uh, who I am as a man. And that is just who I am in my heart of hearts. Like that was coming from the most congruent, authentic place. And she appreciated it. She 100% yeah. appreciated the gesture. And, and so I just thought that was interesting because like you said, like how people do things recreationally tells you a lot more about their character than when they do things for real. I've noticed that. Yeah. And, and so let me ask you this, like how much time do you spend like consuming, you know, like watching Netflix, you know, scrolling social media, like that kind of shit? I haven't had a TV in over 12 years. Uh, literally, I haven't even owned one. I don't know anything about TV. I, I can't name any shows. I have zero clue what the fuck's going on in that world. Um, I I'm a creator, so I'm on my phone. I have a serious phone addiction for sure. But the vast majority of my work on my phone is me creating rather than consuming, which so is like a huge working difference. on your business or making Twitter or stuff like that. Correct. Very, yeah. very, very little consumption of other people's works. I've kind of destroyed all my idols. I really it's funny, man, like I've gotten to a place in my life where the guys that I used to look up to growing up, like I feel like I've surpassed them. Hmm. Like I don't I, I go back and look at their work and I'm like, this doesn't even speak to me anymore. Yeah. And I think I think that's like a huge that's like a really powerful benchmark of knowing where you're at. If you can look back at the old guys that you used to be enamored by and they're just not really that interesting to you anymore. Like that's a really good benchmark of your growth. Yeah. There was a point where I stopped reading like I stopped reading self-development books. I'll do them now for like professional research and things like that. And every once in a while I'll get like a gem uh, in there that's like, oh, yeah, I needed to hear that. Thank you. Uh, but for the most part, yeah, it's like I'm focusing on creating my stuff and I have a theory that it's like the more time you spend um, being like an NPC, like watching someone else's shit, like like watching uh, someone else's story play out. And the more you are hooked into other people's things, like the more you're hooked into oh the um, 
you know, all oh, my sports team or all oh, this athlete or all oh, this celebrity or all oh, this TV show or this video game or this porno or whatever it is, the more you are projecting your your spirit into someone else's plot line, the less vital force you have to put into your own. And I feel like that's that's the thing that's probably killing people the most today, particularly men, is that they are getting sucked into these other things that are not their life. And because like what you were saying earlier, it's like in order for you to be wildly authentic, it's a 24 seven thing because it's, it's constantly non-stop. under. Right. It doesn't stop for a second. And no. so if you as soon as you start giving your power away, you're fucked. Right. You lose it. And then you you crumble and then you it, it takes a while to rebuild that frame. You have it's it's a it's a reconstruction process. It's it ultimately that state is anti-fragile as long as you stay in it. But as soon as you like the closest thing I can think of like that's popping to mind is like Samson getting his hair cut. Right. It's like like letting letting it like getting as soon as he like let let her in. He gave her her way as soon as he stopped living in his own frame. All of a sudden, he couldn't he couldn't lift anymore. He wasn't he lost his strength. Exactly, and that's what it seems like. Exactly, dude. It's like people are like, dude, isn't it exhausting constantly just defending your identity? It's like, dude, it's the opposite. Like, there's nothing more reinvigorating. Like, it's a it's a completion cycle. Like, it drives me. It keeps me on my on my toes. Nothing is more fun. I mean, it's so subtle, dude. It's all the micro things that are so important in life. Like the littlest things that you think don't matter are the things that matter the most. Like even when people ask me a question on Twitter or they DM me, I'm always looking under the surface, like, okay, where's the motivation? Like, what is this? Where's this question really coming from? Is this person trying to waste my time? Are they trying to be parasitical? Like I am constantly, constantly observing and analyzing and breaking things down um, to understand them better. And like, to me, that's like where all the work is like life doesn't even get fun until you can start doing that. Like until you can start really fucking getting into the heart of the matter and learning how these these all these mechanisms work, like life is a complete joke. But like when you get to the level, dude, where you're you're crushing it and you got your shit together and then you can really spend time on understanding human behavior, there's not a more interesting battleground. Like it's all I do now. Right. And it's like those things that used to be completely trivial. It's like, all right, am I going to am I going to break my diet here? Am I going to have like, you know, this cookie or am I going to have this thing? It's like if you lean into them, that's a whole little world. That moment, that moment of sacrifice. If you say no, there's then this this bump of emotion. And if you dive into that, what you find is, oh, shit, that's that's my frame. That's my that's everything that's that's pivoting on this, because as soon as I take this other action, I stop being this person. It changes the narrative of who I am. And that narrative of who you are, that's the code that runs this whole fucking meat machine. As soon as you break that, as soon as you deviate from that, all of a sudden that structure loses form and then you're something else. You're something weaker. You're something more gelatinous and less less robust. That's a great fucking point, dude. It's very true. Like you let that one thing slide. And suddenly you've lost the plot. Like you don't even know who the fuck you are anymore. And that's like a, that's an endless, fathomless, bottomless pit, right? right. Like you, that, that floor never ends, dude. You can just keep descending into these new portals and then, and you're, then you're so fucking flustered and confused and you, you don't know how to get back to where you were. Exactly. That's why too, like, like, I mean, I'm a complete diet freak, dude. Like I have one of the most insane, absurd diets that I've ever met somebody have because I know that that's where I also construct some of that identity maintenance. Yeah, like where, do you, operating. where do you eat? What do you eat? I mean, dude, it's funny. I've been strict carnivore for 15 years, way before it was mainstream, way before wow. anybody even knew what the fuck it was. Um, when people were telling me like, dude, with all this meat you're eating, you're gonna have a heart attack at 30. Um, so yeah, I was just, it's just kind of funny, man. I've just been, I've been steadfast and, you know, staunch about it just for the longest time. And it's, it's done wonders for sure. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's like these little things like your diet because you're constantly doing that as a constant choice about what kind of man am I? You know, simple things like the way that you, you know, clothe yourself, the way you, you present yourself, the way you, you know, like the way you style your hair. That means something to you. It helps you become like tap into the the character of, of who you are, like all this kind of stuff that seems a lot of guys like to dismiss it. They like to dismiss um, the aesthetic as 
irrelevant. Like, and this goes back to your point earlier about how a lot of like super high, like kill, like performance killers or whatever, they have this effeminate side attracted to art, to fashion, whatever. What I really think that is, is like, that's them tapping into that primal self that is irrational. Like our preferences for what our clothing is, what our diet is, what all that stuff is. It's not purely logical, but it's, in abandoning logic and embracing instinct, that's who we find who we are uniquely. Because logic, it's just fucking math. It's impersonal. It has no character to it. It's in our our instincts. That's where we find who we are. That's where we find the weird things that make us our weird ass self, which we can then learn to to dance with, to 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 be, and to let all that stuff out. Absolutely. What you said is very true. I've, I've realized this too. Like you change a man's hairstyle, you change the man. It's a fact. Like if I went and buzzed your head to a zero right now, you're going to, your perception of the world and your perception of your self image is going to drastically change on yeah. the spot. Yeah. Yeah. I've done it. I've done it. I've, I've, I've messed around with it. a lot of it was like, I've, I, I had to screw up with that. It's like I had to, you know, play it inauthentically. Like it's almost like, you know, I'm putting on this costume and this costume is going to let me become someone, but that was fake. It's more just like going the guys ask like they wonder how can they find this? Like how do they find who they are? What is their aesthetic? What is their thing? And it's like it's a journey. It starts by not fucking knowing, trying something, realizing it makes you feel like a retard and then adjusting. And it's like simple like for me, I'm I'm 6'4" and like 230 pounds and it's really hard for me to like find clothes so like my journey of just like learning how to dress myself as you know gay as that sounds like that was like me first of all finding that all right it's worth it for you to like not dress like a moron who has clothes that doesn't fit and then like figuring out well, what do i like what do i wear and it seems effeminate but really what you're doing is you're, you're tapping into that uh, that primal self and figuring out how does that guy get around this world? How does he present himself? How does he communicate verbally, non-verbally? And it, it goes into everything, everything you do. How do you construct your lifestyle? How do you construct your diet? What kind of people do you associate with? All of it. Dude, it's exactly. It's all, it all plays into your poise. Like how you sit in a chair, your posture has a profound impact on your self-conception, your beliefs, what you think about yourself, to, just by changing the positions that your body's in. Yeah. Like, if I'm craning my spine to stand up straight and tall in a chair, that's going to have a completely different uh, impact on my self-perception than if I'm sprawled out and treating the, the chair like it's my fucking bed. Like right. they've actually shown rules, that if you like stand in like a power position or whatever, like it raises your T levels, which is crazy. Hundred percent, that is crazy. But yeah. yeah, dude, I mean, all this shit's fucking critical. Like, if you want me to be my worst self, dude, put me in a fucking put me in slacks with a fucking belt. <laughs> and a fucking dress shirt with a tie. Like that is just not fucking me. I've closed all my biggest deals in my life in joggers and a hoodie. Like <laughs> I just know myself. I've shown up to every business meeting in Nikes and a fucking hoodie. And like, that's just been my fucking calling card forever. That's just what fits. I feel the most comfortable in that avatar and I've run with it. So, I, but I think a lot of guys don't understand like what you're saying. They don't understand that these things are, are interchangeable. Like you have a lot of guys that are just throwing on slacks and a t-shirt because they think that's what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Not or right. <laughs> they say it doesn't matter, right? Like real men don't <laughs> think about this shit, right? Exactly. There's a guy, uh, Tanner Guzzi, who's like a, like a style <laughs> coach or whatever. He's an interesting dude. And he always like posts these pictures of like, you know, traditional men, like, you know, like a war chief from like an Indian tribe or like, you know, a, like a, a fucking general from the past or like a samurai. And they have like these insane ornate like outfits and stuff. And with the caption of real men don't care what they look like or care what they wear. It's like, no, they, they really do like, <laughs> like a lot. <laughs> no, they for sure do. But you know, this also is a touchy thing because a lot of this uh, inverted culture, you see a lot of guys that are so obsessed with aesthetics to the point where, it does get feminine because right. a lot I forget of these, about a lot substance. Of these, exactly, dude. A lot of these guys genuinely want to be prettier than their girlfriends, mm. which is a major fucking mistake. Because I think as a man, like your body of work is an auxiliary form of like how handsome you are. That's just yeah. a fact. That's you know that's your sec that's like a man's tits are his is his business, is his like, you know, his body of work. Like what you're saying. It's like, you know, men 
we have a sex drive to do two things. This is the way I understand it. And this is what helped me understand sexual transmutation is like, you know, say you're this like horny, young hunter gatherer. Okay. You want to have sex. It's like, all right, there's an illicit path. You could like go become a thug and, you know, rape a chick. Okay. Or you could go behind a bush and jerk off. But the way you're meant to do it, the way you evolved to do it, to work within a community and that sort of thing is you got to go gain some status. You got to become useful to the village. You have to take that drive for sex and put it into status acquisition. That is your sexual appendage, right? It's like that's how you you earn it. And so your sexuality is like it either can go directly into, you know, relations with a woman or it can go into to conquest, more or less. That's what you're built for. And if you abandon that, then, or, or you get it twisted up and you start thinking that, oh, I'm just supposed to be pretty like a chick, it's like you're playing the game wrong. You're playing well, your biology wrong. Playing your biology completely wrong. But a lot of guys are, are f completely focused on this. Like, they actually don't think they need a body of work. They just think that if they hand some max or get as, looks as max as, yeah get as beautiful as possible that somehow they're just gonna fucking nail every chick and it's like the dude who you constantly call ugly is getting all the chicks you want it's interesting <laughs> like one of the things one of the things recently that's gotten me the most hate online was i was talking about the guys who are obsessed with the gym and how a lot of them are losers like all they do is like they spend all their day in the gym. They, you know, they have a shitty job. They have like poor social skills, all that kind of they, like they put everything into gym and just looking better. I'm just like, that's not being a good man. And women actually don't want that. And so many people, they fucking blew up at me. They got so pissed. It was like the most hate I've ever gotten online. I'm like, why is everybody disagreeing with this? I thought it was like just a an obvious point that was going to do like so, so numbers or whatever. Uh, but people lost their shit on it. I'm like. What is yeah, going on cause here? Because it's, it's a fucking zinger of truth. <laughs> you, you you fucking struck a nerve there, man, because it is it is absolutely 100% the case. Biggest losers I know are four hours a day in the fucking gym. Uh, it's the only only identity that they have. And there's there's nothing outside that artifice of just big muscles. Like there's no there's no mindset there. There's no drive. They feel like they belong there. It's it's a very bizarre pathology, man. It's it's a uh, it's kind of like the same. On. It's kind of like the same thing as like guys like really hooked into video games. Like I've been that guy, you know, I've been really hooked into the competitive video games. I was a total nerd with it. Um, and it's like you have this safe little area where you can sort of masturbate that status seeking part of your of your male brain where it's like, oh, I'm getting better and stronger. But it's in like a fake arena. It's like it's like a kiddie zone. And I think the gym actually is like that to some degree. It's like, it is. you know. It's just a place where guys know that there's no real threat to them. There's no real risk. There's no stakes. And as long as I get like big in here, then that means I'm I'm the big man. It's like, no, not exactly. You're playing in a very, very small pond. <laughs> very tiny pond, dude. You want to talk <laughs> about low stakes. <laughs> so I was asking um, I was asking about like, you know, so you, you smoke. What what do you you said you do it for the health benefits? What's up with that? I was being facetious, but it, it, it really is um, the art itself of smoking, like the actual gestures, the mannerisms, like the art of like drawing it in is like a very kind of it's almost like a, for, a working form of meditation for me. Mm -hmm. Like just the act of smoking is, is more um, gives me more benefits than the smoking itself. Um, I, I really. I like smoking because I can still be myself. I can yeah. drive fast. I can gamble. I can be sharp as fuck and still it's, it's all, I mean, it is a drug, let's be honest, but it's one of the only few drugs that you can in, in, ingest that doesn't change your personality. That's true. I, uh, that and like, you know, caffeine and stuff. And I, I'm the kind of guy who like doesn't get addicted to cigs. Like I can have, like what I'll do is I'll fall into a pattern where I have like one to two a day, just kind of like a, just like a little treat. Um, Lately, I'm, I haven't been doing it because I, I did it for like a few weeks straight. But yeah, I just I fucking love cigarettes. They are a fun thing um, and they do make you look cooler. I don't care what anyone else says. I think they look fucking cool. Uh, and it's just one of those things where it's like, you know, if you're healthy and you're living well, I, I wonder how much a moderate cigarette usage really does to a person. Now, I don't know if you're moderate at all with with it but there's always like these cases of people who like they live to be like 95 or 105 or whatever it is and they like smoke a pack a day and like that kind of shit it's just i don't know if that's all genetics or or what but i've got this theory that so much of like what um 
impacts your health is the mindset in, with which you do it with. So if like you smoke cigarettes to escape your emotions, that's going to be toxic for you. If you if you eat food like for, with a, a way to escape your emotions or you're constantly doing it from this place of like, you know, anger or resentment or whatever it is, that's more toxic than the actual substances. And that's just, you know, my woo woo theory out there. But I'm curious, what do you think of that? I think it's true. I think it's the same thing with stress. I think that business stress and stress that's coming from a genuine place of challenge and growth actually is the fountain of youth. Like Hmm. I've been under so much unbelievable stress in my life, but um, it's a good kind of stress. Like the the aimless rushing when you don't have a place to be, uh, that type of stress is the stress that really fucking ages you like shit and wears you down. So it's like, it's like you said, it's all the place that you're negotiating from. Like for me, a cigarette is is very much not an escape. it's just more of an enhancement. Like it's like a, a cigarette's almost like a Swiss army knife to me. Like I can fucking do anything with a cigarette in my hand. Like I can fucking write a novel. I can fucking, I can do anything. You know, there's like, there's no limit, there's no limitation there. And it's just, a, um, it's, it's a very therapeutic kind of mechanism in, in, in some degree. But I mean, dude, I, I'm fucking hand rolling 60 cigarettes a day right now. Jeez. I've been chain gunning the equivalent of three packs a day, bro. I don't feel any performance deficit whatsoever do you do any like cardio none but i'm in phenomenal fucking shape dude i mean i'm i'm squatting heavy i'm fucking i I have a ton of endurance like i have not noticed any deleterious effects whatsoever wild in my in my work capacity huh that's interesting But like you said i do everything else right yeah yeah do you what what do you do for lifting i i if i'm remembering correctly did you say like you were like quitting olympic lifting like you were super into that yeah yeah, so I, uh, I I got into more like farm boy, like country boy workouts hmm. where like I'll load two bars with like 500 pounds, so 250 in each hand, and I'll just go walk that contraption for like 100 feet. Okay, yeah. Stuff like that. So I'm just like doing like heavy carries. I'm just doing more like functional outdoor style stuff. That's cool. Um, yeah, it's pretty fucking cool. That's nice. Yeah, I, I had like a uh... – a big powerlifting phase for a while. Like when I first got into it, it was like bodybuilding and then powerlifting. And, uh, I just didn't like the way that powerlifting made my body feel like, you know, it was just, and as I like kept doing it and stuff, it just, it didn't work for me. And so what I've switched to, uh, is this weird thing called like gear of voice sport or kettlebell sport. It's just like this. Do you know what that is? Yeah. You're doing long cycles. Yeah. Yeah. That stuff is, I liked it because like, I was looking for something that I could like integrate more spiritually and just doing like, it's basically like endurance Olympic lifting pretty much. Like it's cause you're either doing snatch or like essentially clean and, and jerk. Uh, but you just can't put the bells down. And so it's just like, you, you just go into this, this mode that's like, it works everything. It's <laughs> like, you know, musculature endurance, like the whole thing. And so, uh, that's that's what I've been messing with lately. That's that's quite the journey. It's very humbling, though. <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, that's a that's a serious mental game, right? I mean, Absolutely. The, the mental toughness that you're building under those under those loads is insane. I mean, I've looked at some look at some of those master of sport guys. I mean, I've watched I watched a guy break the long cycle record, and it was one of the most incredible feats of human performance I've ever seen. Right. You like I mean, it was unbelievable. The thing is, like with a lot of stuff, it's like you can't really appreciate it unless you already have like some physical experience with the things right like Mm -hmm. you know people who who see like a big strong guy like lift like this you know huge weight or you see someone do like long cycle for for 10 minutes with 140 pounds it's just like you don't really have a frame of reference for it it's all like for me the the more i get to like know things the more i realize like (laughs) the freaks that are out there like how truly monstrous they are like the things that they can pull off it's insane what the human mind is capable of and it's almost like you need to reach a certain level of personal accomplishment, which then opens up your view of like, oh shit, I'm just, I'm just scratching the surface. I'm just a, I'm just a child in this game. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. That's why I always say, dude, like you don't want to slay your demons all the time because like your demons want to be put to work. Like there's no doubt in my mind when I see a dude complete a 10 minute long cycle, like that dude has, you have to have some serious fucking demons somewhere to fucking pull that off. And like those demons want to be put to work. And I think that's like a healthy application. Like we're talking about some of those dark forces. 
Yeah. And it, what, what's weird is like if I'm if like back when I would like split my time between all right, I would like I would live the what I call like the 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 default mode of operation. Like modern modern day says, hey, you need to have like your job that sucks. Then you need to have this period of time where you just escape from your job and you just like jerk off, play video games, watch TV. And, you know, maybe if you're you're a good person, you'll work out and stuff, too. Um, when I was living like that, the the workouts would drain me. And because like there would be like this competition of, of energy. But like when you take out that that bullshit layer of the escapism, it seems like the harder the workout is, the more the more energy you get then. If that does that make any sense to you or is it makes tons of sense? It's the difference between fighting against yourself and competing with yourself. I think a lot of guys are going into the gym and they're using it as a form of like self flagellation. It's almost like a cutter. Like a lot of guys, I, I noticed this in like long uh, endurance athletes who go on like crazy fucking super marathons. Like they're metaphorically running away from themselves when they're doing those long runs. Like, there's no doubt in my mind there's some fucking like self-punishment, self-abuse going on there. But when you go in with the mindset of you're competing with yourself, I think like it kind of goes back to your whole holistic approach of excellence. Like you can push yourself a lot farther when you're not fighting against yourself all the time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's like the, the whole thing's got to line up. And I think that's that's really the key of all of it is like for guys looking for true masculinity it's like you can't abandon the holistic and i think we've got so many guys in the manosphere or whatever that they just want to they want to carve out their niche and i get it you need like people trying to make a buck you know i'm not going to begrudge anyone their hustle you you niche down you you and you try and make that thing seem like it's the most important thing but when you do that it's like you're breaking apart the human organism and uh you, you're just you're not going to find your function so it's coming back to this this whole level holistic approach to life and going at it full force. That's that's the key. Exactly, dude. Like even when it comes to making money, like that's like the most personalized. That's like a very intimate thing, right? Like discovering how you're going to earn a living is a very, very intimate, deep, um, like almost like sensual process. And so like when dudes ask me, like, how should I make money? How should I make a living? I'm like, dude, like no other man can answer that question for you. Like that is a deep existential question that is hardwired in you. Like, I don't know what your fucking talents are. Like only you would know that. So like we have to, a lot of these guys have to answer these big, deep questions for themselves. And I know why they're asking the question because they want to stall. They know the answer, but they just want to stall and delay doing what they, what they know they want. They want to hear a, an answer that is going to throw them off course so they don't have to do the thing that they want to do. They're, they're praying that you're going to give them the wrong answer so they can go fuck around and philander for another fucking six months before they actually begin. Yeah. The, the thing that I've seen with like in relation to that, like guys looking for their path, like when they, when they say they don't know what it is, usually what I found is that they know exactly what it is. It's just, they're either trying to, they're trying to skip ahead it's like, like, what am I supposed to do? What's what kind of business I'm, am I supposed to build? And usually they have some kind of glaring problem just like sitting there that they're just ignoring. Like they've got, you know, a drug problem, a porn problem, like, you know, they're completely out of shape, whatever it is. Um, they're, you know, their relationships, a total shit show. It's like a lot of times it's just like the, the, the problem that will unlock your answers the, especially when you really start this journey, it's a humbling one, right? Like for me, I was out of college, you know, I, I quit my software engineering job and that's what I went to school for. And I was like trying to become this, this big, bad life coach. Cause I'd studied all this self-development and shit. And, uh, I couldn't do it. I couldn't fucking focus for more than an hour at a time. Uh, it was, it was embarrassing. And what I had to do is I had to humble myself. My problem was I was addicted to porn. I was addicted to video games. I was like, that was what I needed to do. But as I addressed that, holy shit, this whole world opened up to me. The next layer, you know, happened. It's like you can't skip levels in this kind of thing. No, dude, that's like like one of the central tenets of my philosophy is like that's why dudes end up self-destructing. And like people who come into big sums of money or get a windfall or like these crypto kids who got super rich, super fast without any mm -hmm. talent, they just got lucky. Like they, they purposely will burn all that money because they know they skip steps. 
and now you're lonely now you're lonely as fuck because like there's a certain social stratum like you, if you mature faster than your money does you're always gonna fucking piss it away like your finances can't mature faster than you mm. does that make sense yeah because i think you know every, we're always going to try and bring things into congruence so if like you are you know not aligned with who you are you're like you, you don't know who you are like you're you're you know you're Met mixed up here, there, or another. It's it's always going to get reflected not only in your finances, but in your relationships and in your physicality. Like literally all of it. It's always going to mirror itself. That's what I found. Is like no matter what it is you're looking at. Like I read this book um, a long time ago. It's called The Holographic Universe, and the idea is that every single thing is a hologram containing the information of every other thing, and that concept's always stuck with me because it's like you can find the universe in, you know, a little atom. You can find it in like this habit. You can find it in over here. But like when you tweak one piece of it, the whole thing moves. So it's like you can't, there's no looping around it. It's always going to come back to, to where you're at. Always. Yeah. Yeah. So What's uh what's going on with you and, and Twitter? Like, are you trying to do anything with it? You trying to like build any product? Or are you just like, you know, having fun, like shooting your, your thoughts out there? You know, I did build a product about a, a year and a half ago. Um, it was a video course that I created. Um, it, it did very well. It was very successful um, because I just wanted to kind of test the market. I didn't I didn't believe Internet money was real. I didn't believe people were really making these kind of figures on the Internet. So I wanted to kind of dive in and test it for myself. So I built this product, launched it, and it did really well. And then um, I've just been so focused on scaling my own business that I kind of put it on the back burner. Yeah. But yeah, man, I mean, my Twitter for me just kind of feels like a civic duty um, at this point. Like I just, I, I, I it feels like something I just have to continue to build and grow. Um, for whatever reason it's and it's been very cathartic i mean i treat my page like a fucking journal i'm not really tweeting for anybody but myself yeah yeah and so you're just kind of putting those insights out that you really want to burn into your own head kind of thing that's exactly right it's a it's a reinforcement mechanism for my own life and if it resonates it resonates and if it doesn't it doesn't but i'm not um i'm certainly not here for like a dog and pony show like i'm i'm very centered in what i'm doing and i I, I just feel this sort of urge to just continue to just keep pushing it um, because I, I know it is impactful. I mean, the, the DMs that I get and the feedback has been unbelievable. Um, I'm mentoring a lot of guys. I, I just I, I'm very active in the community. And, you know, I guess my goal ultimately, dude, is to build a community where ultimately I can have it in person. Mm. Like I, I need I want to take some of these relationships offline and actually have like like real meaningful connections. I think that's the end goal for me. I love that. Yeah, I, yeah. I've, I've always been focusing on the, the virtual side because I'm trying to reach the, the most guys that I can. But I'm realizing how much there's just there's just a lot of intangibles lost on the virtual you know way of doing things. And you just there's something that you can't replicate. So I, I'm I'm hoping that within the next few years I can get something in person as well. So I, I feel you on that. So if people want to follow you, best thing then just follow you brute to force on Twitter. Yeah, brute to force on Twitter, um, brute of force on Instagram. Um, okay. I'm not super, act, not super active on there, but one of my Twitter fans, I guess, stole my moniker on Instagram and got the <laughs> got the name before I did. Uh, yeah, so okay, well, nice man. I mean, you should be doing more interviews and stuff because it was you know been a blast talking with you. I uh, hopefully you enjoyed it as well. Hopefully everyone listening got something out of it. I know I did. Um, and I would love to have you back sometime here soon. Yep. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you again. All right. All right, everybody. Thanks. Uh, make sure you check out my manhood mastery training down in the description. Ooh, yeah. See you all later. Care, bro.